in this segment, we're going to deal with the Mount Everest of God's attributes, and that is His, his love. And so I, I think it's appropriate that we pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please anoint me with your Holy Spirit to explain what it means that you are love and you express love for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I think it would be a good place to start to read from 1 John chapter 4 as we deal with this marvelous attribute of God, his love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. First John 4, 7 through 12. You know, the story is told of how the famous or infamous German theologian Karl Barth came to the United States and a seminary student asked him what was the most profound theological truth that he had ever encountered. And he thought for a moment and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So simple, but so very profound. Profoundly simple, simply profound. This text explicitly says that God is love. That's strong. And as Bart indicated, his love in the cross is a central message of the New Testament. God's love of sinners. God is love. As central as this trait is, God's love, we cannot turn it around and say that love is God. That, that would be a false statement. And in addition, uh, just by way of introduction, I would also gently warn us against um, favoring this attribute, as I have tended to do, above others, as that would tend to... to imbalance our view of God. God is love, but he's not only love. He is holy, he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, he is omnipresent, immutable, jealous, just, and righteous. He is as a holy love, an omnipotent love, a jealous love. And how many times have you heard someone reply, my God is a God of love, on Facebook or something? Well, the criterion we look to is not what our opinion is of God. We look to the Word of God to find out what God says about himself. And in this case, what he means by saying that he is love. The comment that I mentioned that um, my God is a God of love is often in response to some strong assertion that you may have made or I may have made regarding God's other attributes or making some strong statement about the need to be discerning or, you know, judging between this or that type thing and in a, in a kind way, in a biblical way, which is interesting because John actually co commands us to discern between Antichrist and Christ in the previous verses to this. Um, so the fact that God is love does not preclude us from being discerning. So, so we, we must not absolutize this attribute 
nor use it to deny other vital biblical truths, or, or we will end up with a toothless God and a false gospel. And we don't want to do that. On the other hand, you know, there is a reason that Paul, uh, in his two recorded prayers in Ephesians 1 and 3, he essentially asks God that we might understand more fully the inexpressible wonderment of God's love and to enjoy that love, that is to um, experience that attribute of love. Uh, he knew then and we know now uh, that we dearly need to understand more deeply just what it means to say that God is love to us. And obviously with Paul, there was something particular about the, the uh, aspect of God's love because that's what he says, you know, God, may you open up the eyes of their heart that they may see and understand at the core of their being the height, depth, width, and length of your love. He doesn't pray that they get something extra, but rather that they understand what they already have and who you already, who God already He is in His love. Okay, there's three things I want to say about this divine love by way of understanding its astonishing magnitude. First, um, let's see. Uh, uh, let me back up for a second and say this. Um, yeah, sorry. There are three things I want to say about this divine love by way of understanding its astonishing magnitude. First, this, lo this love is understood by the degree of the greatness and dignity of the person displaying that love. Secondly, the condition of those who are the recipients of this divine love. And then thirdly, what God did to express this love to the people in that condition. Okay, you follow me? That's kind of like my outline for showing uh, what God's love is and its wonderment. Who it is that's showing it, our condition, and what he did. It is wonderful enough to be loved by a family member, isn't it? But the greatness of and the wonderment and dignity of this love is seen in the obvious fact that it is the love of God. God's love considered as one of his essential traits. Now listen to this, y'all. Eleven times, this blew me away, eleven times in both the Greek and the English, eleven times in six verses, God, or Theos, is explicitly mentioned. And if you include the pronouns and the references to the Son, God is mentioned 16 times in six verses. So this is a God-saturated text. The wonder of God's love is remembering that it is His love. In his gospel, John reminds us in chapter 1 and chapter 17 that before the, the world was created, the intra-Trinitarian persons took infinite delight in and loved each other. Before the world existed, he was and is a God of love. But now this love is expressed to us. And as we look at the nature of God as Trinity, I think when we read that God is love that takes on a whole new rich meaning to it when we understand the loving relational aspect of the Godhead and how he is love in terms of his, those uh, relationships. So the infinite dignity, beauty, and worth of our God makes this love singular, unique, infinite in its dignity and beauty. The infinite God, who is love, displays infinite love. The self-existent God, who does not need our love, but who rejoices in it, nevertheless, 
the omnipotent king who sustains and governs every molecule in this cosmos. The all-knowing God and the immutable and omnipresent God is the one who loves us. How great a God and how great a love. But most amazingly, he is holy and he still loves us. John hammers home. It is God the Lord who is loving. We talked about the Lordship attributes of control, authority, and uh, presence. As Lord, that means that his love is a sovereign, all-powerful love. His divine authority is expressed and magnifies this divine love. And his covenantal love expresses itself through his presence with us. The divine person displaying this love to us is the infinite personal triune God who created the vast cosmos. This is not the love of a creature. If the greatness of God's love is measured by the degree of the greatness and dignity of the person, capital P, displaying that love, then this love is unspeakably infinite and beautiful, for he is unspeakably lovely and beautiful. He is Yahweh. I am who I am. No greater love, because he, it is the love of God himself. But secondly, God's love is measured in who it is that he loves their condition, our condition. We've seen who God is, now us, who's the recipients of this love. Do we deserve God's love? We are wholly unlovely and unworthy. The text says that we did not love God first, but that he loved us, verse 10. We're not a people who are universally falling all over ourselves to love God. No, in Ephesians 2, it says that the whole mass of humanity apart from Christ is corrupt. The living dead, spiritual zombies, biologically alive, but spiritually dead. Not sick, not even very sick spiritually, but dead in sin. To quote Ephesians 1 through 3, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Worse we are nature by nature, children of wrath. We're objects of, we're objects of God's curse. In one sense, he is incensed with all mankind. Uh, far from Christ, we are at enmity with him and he with us. We hated our creator and suppressed the knowledge of him, Romans 1.18. Further, we were blinded by the powers of darkness. We are indeed his enemies apart from Christ. He is holy and righteous, and we are unholy and unrighteous. We have committed cosmic treason against an infinitely holy God who has infinite intrinsic dignity. This means that our sins are not little mistakes or peccadilloes, but massive rebellion and treason against our infinitely worthy creator and king. In a word, we are wholly unworthy of God's love. Indeed, what we deserve is his wrath and eternal hell. The seriousness and sinfulness of sin is measured by the dignity of the person against whom we have sinned. And as we've seen, since God is infinitely holy, lovely, and righteous, then we have committed sins worthy of infinite punishment. But the thoughts, and this comes from Genesis, but this was not said just prior to the flood, but after the flood, before. But the thoughts and inclinations of our thoughts are only evil all the time. What a commentary on human nature. This is about as strong as it gets in the Bible. 
And as I said, after the flood, this was reaffirmed by God. So in a word, we are wholly undeserving of this divine love, which makes it all the more amazing, obviously. So, lastly, okay, we've talked about who it is that gave the love to us in our condition. What is this, what has this God done? Well, I remind you that by nature we're children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But then in verse 4 it says, But God, as I'm sure you've heard some of the most lovely words in, in the Bible, but God, that spells a difference between heaven and hell. Those two words, but God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love, great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, elsewhere we are told that scarcely a right, righteous man would die for another, but in this text God shows his love by sending his Son, in verse 9, for his enemies. It is a father whom we have universally rejected, according to Romans 1.18 and following. But note that it's the Father who sends the Son. And as it says in Hebrews, Christ is a great apostle, in the general sense, meaning that he was sent. It was the Father who lovingly sent the Son, even though it's the Father whom we have universally rejected. But, you know, obviously Christ came willingly, not because we loved him, but because he loved us. Did, why did the Trinity love us? Because he loved us. And why did he choose to love us? Because he loves us. I'm sorry, you can't get any further back than that. I've looked, and um, I can assure you there's no no further reasoning than that. God loved us because he loved us because he loved us. Romans 5 eight. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet his enemies, while we hated him, he, he gave everything he could give. The Father, who is all-powerful, gave all he had. Do you realize that this omnipotent God could not have done more or given more than he did? He gave everything he had or could to secure our salvation. He gave everything. All he had. And Christ knew the great cost. Acting as the second man and the last Adam in the garden, Christ was filled with the realization of the unspeakable horrors facing him and the agony that awaited him on the cross. And now we are approaching the heart of love. In verse 10, we see a word which we could easily overlook and actually has all but disappeared from preaching and pulpits today. And it contains the, the heart of the gospel. I mean the heart, and that's the word propitiation. This is where we see the full extent of God's love. This is the gospel, but it's been so submerged in the cost God paid to redeem us. That's what this is all about. This is how we measure love, is it not? By its costliness? The word in the Greek is hilasterion, and it's also used in the same uh, book in 1 John 2, too. Um, 
There's expiation where God covers sin, and there's propitiation where God in his wrath punishes that sin because in his justice he he has to punish the, the sin. And as we're told in Romans, that God was just in the way that he justified us. All right. Now, at the heart of the cross is a curse motif, which is mentioned in Galatians 3, where Christ became a curse for us, so that God's love might fully bless us. You know, when we think of a curse, we think of a voodoo doll or some form of a cult ritual, don't we, in which a person is cursed. Yeah, that's real. Uh, I've seen it. But this is a, div a divine curse. Um, this curse motif goes throughout the Old Testament. I think of the Day of Atonement. But let me read quickly from Deuteronomy uh, 28. You, you got the blessing and the curse motif um, um, together. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of the ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall be you when you go out. Pretty comprehensive blessedness, huh? That's really meant to be uh, not exhaustive, but um, representative. But the flip side is true as well. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be your fruit of the womb and fr the fruit of the ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you Come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Once again, it is comprehensive in its picture of cursedness, depending upon relation to obeying or disobeying God uh, and his law. On the cross, he was, for the first time, the second person in the Trinity was naked and ashamed before his father. To elucidate this love in its full extent, I want to do something a little different. I want us to look at the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron, which was pronounced over God's covenant people by the high priest. Your pastor probably mentions it uh, pretty often uh, in your services. But here the great high priest experienced the curse part of Deuteronomy 8, 28, which is prefigured in Genesis 15 that I talked about in an earlier segment. This substitutionary vicarious atonement, um, there's an element of cursedness which is all but missing from modern pulpits. And what I'm about to say may come as a shock to you, but I'm going to take their ironic, um, well, let me read the, the beautiful blessing first. Speak to Aaron, thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now that's, that's a beautiful blessing. Now, we're told in Galatians that Christ became a curse for us. Um, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. And I want, on the cross, Jesus experienced the, the propitiatory curse upon our our eternally blessed Savior 
for us experience the opposite of the Aaronic blessing. We could put it this way. God help me. May the Lord, this is what happened when Jesus was on the cross. May the Lord curse you and forsake you utterly. May the Lord make his face to smolder with rage towards you and turn the lights out. And may he pour out his infinitely furious wrath upon you. And the land turn dark. And may you not experience his grace but his justice. May the Lord frown in fury upon you. And may he torment your soul. May you be cursed, cut off from me. Jesus wasn't just cursed, he became a curse. Which is why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all infinite in eternity, touching his human nature, Christ was utterly cut off fellowship with his fathers. Ladies and gentlemen, please excuse my language, but it is as if the father said to his beloved son, May God damn you. For that is what curse means. God damning to hell. Now how can we cheapen this infinitely costly gospel with a faulty message? But what a what a love. What a love that the Father has shown to us. By disregarding it, downplaying it, we have missed the heart of the gospel. Behold, what manner of love God has displayed to unworthy sinners like you and I. Without propitiation, we have no forgiveness of sins, no awareness of God's ultimate expression of self-sacrificing love. How, how we have mangled and watered down the gospel to make it more appealing to modern ears. God does. Well, let me ask this. Does God love everyone in the same way? And should we, should we tell a group of sinners that God loves them unconditionally? Uh, I'm asking this with all the tenderness of my heart. Please listen carefully. In light of what we've said, see, we must remember that we don't live in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but in God's world in which he does not invite sinners to Christ, but he commands sinners to repent and believe. And if they don't meet these conditions, God will hate them and curse them for eternity. Now, does God love unconditionally everyone? Now, to answer that question, let me remind you that there in the Bible there are three kinds of divine love, which you can see in the preaching to the sinners in the book of Acts. I've done a, a um, comprehensive study of the apostolic preaching and the content of it in the book of Acts, and you'll search in vain to see them ever say to a group of sinners that God loves you unconditionally. They never tell sinners that. Now, so is it right for us to say God loves you unconditionally? Well, yes and no. It all depends upon what you mean. So bear with me, okay? Um, this is a touchy subject. In Acts 17, this is a good example because as I said, there's three kinds of divine love. There is what is known as the love of benevolence, 
whereby God expresses an attitude of goodwill toward all his creation. That's seen in Acts 17. Secondly, there is the love of beneficence. It was benevolence and then beneficence. See, where this divine attitude, this is where the divine attitude expresses itself in actions of kindness towards all mankind. You're familiar with the text where it says, God sends the sunshine and the rain upon the just and the unjust. That's God's common grace. That's his beneficent love. Then third, there is God's filial, filial love, which is expressed to his only begotten son and those who by union with him, by faith and repentance, are God's sons and daughters by adoption, John 1.12. But it has to be met by specific conditions, faith and repentance. So when we tell Again, I say this very gently. When we tell folks, because I've said this many times myself, God loves you unconditionally. When we tell folks that God loves all people unconditionally, I suspect we often are confused as to which love we mean. Benevolence, beneficence, or filial love. I think we usually mean, rightly, uh, is that... Um, God loves you with the love of benevolence or bene beneficence, which he does. That's what Paul preached to, uh, on the Areopagus. And I think it's also very appropriate um, to, when we say that God loves you as you are, what we mean is you don't have to clean yourself up before coming to him in repentance and faith. You don't have to get yourself worthy to come before him. That's that's appropriate to, to to say. Remember, but remember this the saying regarding communication. Um, there is what we think we say. There is what we actually say, and then there is what people hear. So my question is, what do people hear when we tell a group of sinners? that God loves them unconditionally. Again, I say this with all the tenderness in my heart. What people often hear may not be what we mean, but what they hear when we tell them that God loves them unconditionally just as they are is this. They hear this. There are no conditions to God's love. So I can live any way I like and reject the gospel because God loves me unconditionally. When it comes to experiencing the first two kinds of love, there are no conditions. God loves everybody regardless. In, in that sense, love of benevolence and God, uh, love of benef beneficence. But God's filial love is extraordinary love of family. That unconditional love for his family. There are most certainly conditions to God's love, or we destroy the gospel of the conditions of faith and repentance as necessary requirements to enter God's kingdom and be saved from his eternal wrath and hell. Do we earn the salvation? Do we have to clean ourselves up before God will accept us by faith alone? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. It's all those things. But nevertheless, let, let us be careful when we talk about uh, God's unconditional love and what we um, are communicating to people. Okay, my dear friends, that's all, that's all I'm asking that we do. Alrighty. In closing, we are exhorted in this text to imitate Christ's sacrificial love by loving others. This is an important part of the Holy Spirit's intent for this text. Verse 7 and verse 11, as Christ has loved us, we should love others. That's 
God is love. You know, as I pondered the innumerable ways to apply this, I was drawn back to the intra-Trinitarian love within the Godhead. You know, they delight in expressing self-effacing love to and delight in each other, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And on a positive note, I can envision the society of the tri-persons in a friendly competition of complimenting each other. In their own language, they express the fruits of the Spirit and how they speak to each other. Compliments. I can I can just picture that in my mind. Negatively, as I tried to ponder, I cannot even begin to think of one person in the Trinity, the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, criticizing another one. The thought is... The thought of the Father criticizing the Son is utterly repugnant to me, to my mind. And all I know about God, He is love in His intratrinitarian communication. And love does not criticize. But there's a deeply Theirs is a deeply communicative relationship. And as Jesus said, it's out of abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And the Lord's brother, James, reminds us how little the mouth is, but how it can set the course of one's life on fire with a fire from hell. In closing, in a marriage or in some significant relationship, there's countless sources of potential stress. However, it is what we say to each other while stressed or angry that determines whether that stress ultimately builds us up or breaks us down. We are to love in how we communicate as in the Trinity and mirroring the love of Christ, love being the first fruit of the Holy of the Spirit and the highest virtue. Compliments versus criticism. That is by far the key to an intimate marriage. Or relationship. I'm speaking generally because I'm well aware of how infidelity and lying can destroy trust. What we say and how we say it will either cause the relationship to flourish or flounder, drift apart. Not the stress itself. It'll either pull you together or push you apart. It's how you respond and what you say. We can become very creative and justify and explaining away our criticalness. Uh, it's just advice, just sarcastic joking, constructive input, etc. Do you want to experience a home that's marked by renewed joy, security, passion, love, and enjoyment? Then do not say everything that comes to your mind. Put a muzzle on your mouth. And try, even if, if it feels odd, to sincerely compliment your lover or your loved one. At the end of the day, have your compliments far outweighed your criticisms. One kind compliment can change the entire ambiance of a home and begin to express the joy of the Trinity and show the sacrificial love of Christ. That's the least we can do in the light of all the love the Trinity has lavished on us in Christ. Amen.